you're very welcome to the Scalex Insider podcast. It has taken me a couple of years to finally have this conversation with you. So I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Really looking forward to the discussion. We've been chatting off air. You know, our vision is to inspire, connect and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small and medium sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So Alex, what does scaling with purpose mean to you? <laughs> well, I think scaling has a bit of a negative connotation. People you know, want to grow to grow. I think, um, you know, in my case, you want to grow to have more impact. So it's not about how much turnover you're going to make, how many people you're going to hire. It's, you know, <laughs> what's the impact you want to achieve? Can we grow the impact? which could be in the market, which could be, you know, with our employees. So for me, that's scaling with purpose, having more and more impact with the actions we take. Yeah, and uh, that's a beautiful segue into your wonderful work. You're having an incredible impact on the world. Uh, I, I came across your work, first of all, I was hosting a strategy session amongst our leadership team probably about 10 years ago, and the facilitator at the time introduced me to this wonderful new concept of the business model canvas. Uh, it just coincided with iPads coming out as well, so we were, we were really going all in with the technology and this new uh, pit stop that we were having with the, the leadership team. I, I love your books. I love the design. I have the, the value proposition design here. You've clearly, for those who are listening, you can't see, but there's almost a, a playful cartoon quality to these. Can you tell me a little bit about that? What, you know, you've clearly thought about this uh, and we can see your backdrop as well. Yeah. You know, when we started out with uh, my co-author and friend, Yves Pigneur, we asked ourselves, what's the kind of book we want to make? Like, how should a good business book look like? And for us, it was all about, you know, making very practical and very visual so you could, you know, consume it in a way that you can use this stuff right away. And I think that is a type of business book that is now very common. Uh, we were among the first, we weren't the first to make visual business books, but we believe that's just the right format for the stuff we do to make it very approachable and applicable and from then onwards you know all of a sudden a lot of landscape sized books with visuals came out i do think some actually get it and some don't you know visuals is not lipstick on a pig uh, visuals is to communicate a message so i really believe that this mix between words and visuals is a better user experience better user interface uh, for some of the business content sometimes we use words when we shouldn't use words, we should actually use visual and words, right? So uh, that's what we try to perfect. That's our way of creating books. And uh, I think it's worked pretty well. Yeah, clearly it has. And before we get into it, uh, and specifically into value proposition, it's the seventh principle of our, of our 10 principle scale X framework. So I'd love to do a little mini masterclass on that today. But you've hit on something just in the context of communicating as a leader you know, your work has reached millions, literally one of your, uh, one of your little um, uh, instructional videos on the business model canvas has, has more than 5 million views. How has your communication style developed since the business model canvas was first released all of those years ago? And what now have you kind of landed on as the, the optimum way of, to communicate as yeah. a leader? So when, again, when we started out, well, there are many tools now, right? Value proposition canvas, business model canvas, portfolio map. But when we started out, it was this movement of design thinking and visual thinking that kind of came together. And then it was the internet boom. And we really were fascinated about bringing these things together. That's how the business model canvas emerged. When it became so successful, we asked why. So we did, you know, and former academics and Eve, you know, now retired, was an academic until his retirement. We try to figure out why, why was there so much success? And the thing that we learned is that very simple, practical visual tools have an outsized impact on collaboration. They create a shared language so that people from different backgrounds can have better conversations. And, you know, business models might have not been a topic as much 
a decade or two decades ago because everybody had a similar business model and it was all about execution. Well, today you have so many choices to make and there's so many business model options, you know, online, mobile, in terms of channels, the different partners you can work with, different kind of ecosystems you can build. You really need to rethink the fundamentals of your business, which is the business model, not just products, not just technology. That's not enough. You can't compete on products and technology anymore. You need to have a better business model if you want to stay ahead. And what we realized is that when you have a visual tool that's simple and practical, like the business small canvas, you can get people you know, in a leadership team or from different parts of the business, technology, marketing, operations, together and have a shared language and a good conversation. If you just talk, it's blah, blah, blah. We actually created a no blah, blah card. <laughs> we hold it up when people just talk. No, you want to have an artifact that you can work around. And the business small canvas is an artifact of your business small. Very simple to use. So we realized doing some research, people want simple, practical, visual business tools to have better conversations on their most important topics, business models, value propositions, organizational culture. If you do not have a visual tool to structure your conversations and make that conversation tangible, you're going to end up in blah, blah, blah with no results. And after the meeting, you're just as clueless as before. Or even worse, you think you're aligned, but you're not. So, you know, there are professions like architecture where you never would have a conversation without visual artifacts. Yeah. Turns out in business, it's very similar. If we have visual artifacts, we have better conversations. Instead of a building plan or a mock-up, it's actually, you know, a business model canvas. But it's the same principle. Can't build a house without plans. Well, you can't build a business without a business model canvas, you know, more modern and simpler version than the business plan, which is an execution document. We want a design kind of construct, which is which are tools like the business model canvas. For those who are not familiar with the business model canvas, uh, we want to do a deeper dive today into the value proposition element of the, the business model canvas. But just to, to bring it back, you're very aware, obviously, you've created the tools around business model, but for, for those leaders of SMEs who are hearing this concept of business model for the first time, you know, they've developed their product and for them now it's just about selling it. Um, yeah. you know, what is the business model and how has business modeling evolved in the last 10 years and what should, you know, the listeners of, who are leading SMEs be be aware yeah. of now in the in, in, in 2023? Yeah, I, I think, again, you know, business models used to look alike in a specific industry. Right? So every you'd say, oh, I'm in air travel or I'm in banking. Everybody would have the same business model. You might have some differences in the value proposition, the product, or use different technologies, but you didn't have fundamentally different business models. Today, in many, many different arenas, and I don't know any where it's not becoming a challenge, you have fundamentally different business models competing against each other. And now let me give you a simple example. Um, you know, if, if I'm building something and then selling it, that's a very transactional business model. Every day I have to acquire new customers. <laughs> so that is kind of annoying, right? There's a cost to acquisition. If I could turn that business model into one where I lock the customer in and they almost have to come back. You know, maybe it's a positive lock and you, you make them come back and they, you acquire them once and they pay again and again and again. So give me a, I'll give you a silly example. Um, you know, take the iPod. So for those of us who are a little bit older, remember the iPod. Love we think it. It's, yeah, it was a technology uh, innovation, hardware and software. Well, it turns out it was actually a business model strategy. So Steve Jobs famously pulled out the iPod and said, this is the first time you can have thousand songs in a pocket. Now, what people didn't realize is why did Apple want us to put thousand songs into iTunes on the iPod? Because once we put all our songs onto the iPod in iTunes, guess what? The next time you're going to buy a piece of hardware, 
it's going to be so annoying to transfer your thousand songs that you just put onto the iPod to a different system that you're just going to stay in the same system. So you are locked in. And when people think that, oh, yeah, but they earned a lot of money from the songs, it's actually wrong. They had to pay, you know, licensing fees to the majors. And the genius of Steve Jobs was to get the major record companies to actually let him do that. They didn't realize they were signing their death penalty. So that then got people to come back and buy high margin hardware. So yes, it was a technology play to bring it to the market, but the genius was to package that technology in a more powerful business model. So while all the other music players were just the technology play, Apple played a different game. They brought a gun to the knife fight, right? So, so this is now an opportunity for every single business to ask, and this is one example, right? To ask, can I change my business model in a way that I outcompete competitors? Because it's just too hard these days to compete on technology and product because everybody can copy technology and product. And competing on lower prices is a race towards the bottom, red ocean strategy. Those companies that build better business malls create a sustainable competitive advantage and the very best create a culture of constantly reinventing the business model. So the real competitive advantage these days are companies that are able to reinvent themselves all the time while they're successful. And that is definitely not just a domain of large companies. I actually think it's much easier for smaller companies because when you are the decision maker, the owner, the leader, you can make it happen. In large companies, these machines are so big that you have so many stakeholders competing against each other that you know, innovation is really hard to do despite the money they might have. So I believe today is the golden age of small and medium-sized companies because they can go fast and there's a lot at their fingertips that they can use to create powerful business models. Because innovation, in particular business model innovation, is not just about technology. Technology is a means to an end, but you can outcompete others with better business models. You don't even need technology in many cases. Here, here. That'll be music to uh, the, the listeners' ears, those leaders of, of SMEs. Just going back to, to some examples of the, the business model innovations, especially within more traditional companies, because I think we, we will all understand how the software industry has moved. I remember the time whenever, you know, you wanted to implement an ERP system and you, you know, it cost a huge amount of money to buy that enterprise license. And that was, that was it done. You paid for some consultancy to implement it, uh, maybe an upgrade two years later, but it was pretty much done. And then SaaS completely turned the, the, the software industry in its head in terms of a new business model innovation, selling software as a service. Now we don't think of buying licenses. We buy, you know, we, we subscribe on a monthly basis at a much lower rate, but as you mentioned, Alex, we're completely locked in. Um, you know, I have a Microsoft computer here. All of the all of the applications I use are Microsoft products. I subscribe, you know, the, the license renews on an annual basis. I pay a subscription on a monthly basis, whatever. It's, uh, uh, so we, we, I think we can all relate to the software industry and how they have innovated from a business model perspective. What can the leaders who are listening today who are leading more traditional businesses um, yep. uh, think about in terms of business model innovation? Can you provide some examples? Yeah, yeah. I'll give a, a Swiss example. <laughs> Since I'm, I'm ambassador of you know Switzerland, I like Swiss tourism, I like Swiss products. Um, I like Swiss I'll watches. I like Swiss watches. <laughs> yeah, I actually wear a whoop, so not not Swiss watch today. My uh, Patek Philip and my <laughs> is is lost somewhere. But so so take the example of Laura Star. Laura Star is a family owned business, and they traditionally make high end steam irons. Okay, so manufacturing business making steam irons, great. So 
they did look at, you know, technology innovation, stuff with apps and so on. Of course, they do that. It's accessible. Just, you know, they're just the right size to be able to do that. But one of their most interesting innovations actually came from a new value proposition, new business model around a new technology, but that was core to their business. So they came up with a handheld steamer. And you can, with this handheld steamer, you can actually, you know, steam a suit and you can take it with you on your travels and it will, you know, iron out the wrinkles. Great. But that is still in their kind of core history. But they asked themselves, well, is that enough? What kind of business model could we think of <laughs> to address a different market because now we have a handheld steamer and we realize that it actually is very good to kill bacteria and turns out during a, a pandemic you know with a virus and so it all, it really has an impact as well they did some research around that so they said okay let's explore three different potential business models because when you have a handheld steamer that is good at disinfecting as well not just at ironing ironing you can think of different applications. Oh, where could this work? Hotels. Well, they have to clean rooms really quickly. So what if we had something there? Oh, hospitals. Hmm, that could be interesting. Or health conscious, you know, consumers. That's a much broader market than just people ironing their shirts, right? And that may, might be niche and much harder to reach. So they experimented with three different potential business models and three different potential value propositions. And business model innovation sounds like a scary term, but it doesn't yeah. have to be because for them, their business model was making steam irons and selling them through specialty stores. If you now decide to go mass market and sell a handheld steamer, not just to iron out your wrinkles when you're traveling, but also to disinfect your home or children's toys and so, well, the business small changes. Now you're going mass market. Your messaging changes, your marketing changes, your brand changes. So that is a business small innovation. Is it business small innovation in an absolute sense? No. Was it business small innovation for them and a fundamental change in the logic of their business? Yes. So we kind of, you know, think business model innovation as having to do something that's completely new that the world has never seen. That's not true. Business model innovation for a company means creating more value for the customer and more value for them than they have before. That's it. So yeah. what they did is test these three business models and the one um, for the mass market, if you're a health conscious kind of segment that didn't want to use this just for, for ironing, um, in a practical way, but also to disinfect their, you know, homes and children's toys. And so that's what they went for. And they started to sell through, you know, direct to consumer through their own website and mass market channels. That was a fundamental change in their business model. Think of it, right? So small company, small Swiss company, not in the technology business, but in, you know, steam irons, really applied the same principles of business small innovation that you would find in a large company. And turns out they were much faster because the two children who now run the business um, from took over from the father, they're all in. They can make the decisions and then the decisions happen. In a large company, you know, innovators report to the person who reports to the person who reports to the person who reports to the CTO who reports to the CEO. We have this myth that innovation is easier in large companies. I can tell you, I believe it's much easier in smaller companies because you can make things happen. And then there's the other myth. We think, oh, it's all about technology as a small company. I don't have the technology budget. Well, innovation is about creating value for your customers in new ways and creating value for your business in new ways. May or may not require technology. And a lot of the technology is off the shelf and cheap to use. So it's just a mindset thing. I believe innovation in smaller companies is at our fingertips. It's the biggest opportunity. Business small innovation is the biggest opportunity for small and medium-sized companies that has ever existed. Yeah. So just to recap on that, Alex, this isn't a Harvard term. You know, we don't want to kind of turn our listeners off with when we talk about business model innovation. What we're essentially saying is, look, you're selling uh, transacting with your customers today in a certain way, in a certain industry segment. 
business model innovation at its heart is really about standing back and examining is there another way to transact yes. it, to your existing customers but is there even another way to actually taking your existing product or service to other industry segments given that and given the fact that we're saying and i completely agree by the way having come through a small company led it to become a medium size that eventually became a large company the it's much easier to get things done faster and quicker uh, in an sme where does artificial intelligence play a role here especially tools like chat gbt have you seen these now being um embraced by sme leaders to support different business model innovations yeah so where i have seen um, artificial intelligence be applied right away is obviously in the smaller software companies where they immediately realize there's a lot of th there are a lot of things that chat gpt for example you know because it was one of the first to go large scale and they open up their api very quickly i saw software entrepreneurs replacing some of their cost centers with artificial intelligence so you know the the human interaction in certain fields is not required in the same way so a lot of you know um white collar jobs are actually going to go away and I'd say in particular, the lower end to medium end and the requirements for the, you know, very, very qualified white collar jobs are going to go up. So some of the people, the experts are going to get way more expensive and a lot of the kind of generalized experts are going to go away, you know, lawyers and so on. A lot of their, the stuff they're doing is, you know, is, is at risk that software developers are at risk because a lot of the more basic jobs in software development are going to go away. So I see, you know, obviously early adopters are software entrepreneurs who replace certain aspects of their business model with artificial intelligence, in particular dealing with customers, right? Um, or complaints and so on. There's a lot that can be done. Now, that sounds very sophisticated. There are also very kind of down to earth ways of using artificial intelligence, for example, in marketing, right? Your marketing messages. There, you can do things so much faster and more efficiently with you know your first drafts and stuff with with that uh, with uh, artificial intelligence than you can without i just worked on a a draft yesterday you know about a, a merger of uh, or a collaboration of two companies and i didn't want to kind of end up staring at a blank page so i just you know wrote hey chat gpt i need a one page draft of these two companies collaborating make a suggestion, write the first, you know, uh, four paragraphs. There you go. You have a start. And while you can't use it as such, so I'm going to replace the work that I can add there. It gives me a really good prototype to work with. And it's much faster than I would if I asked a team member, because it took exactly, you know, I don't know, five seconds for me to formulate the question and then 10 seconds for chat GPT to, in quotes, reflect Actually, it doesn't think it's just dumb, but it's um, artificial intelligence just turns out, you know, a first prototype. That kind of work um, in drafting documents or, you know, drafting marketing messages and so is, is just so much faster than humans will ever be that a lot of the white collar expensive work um, is going to go away. But it does mean if we take the example that I just said my qualification has to go up because now I need to look at that prototype that was generated by artificial intelligence, clearly not real intelligence. And I need to really see what makes sense, what makes no sense, what is justified, what is not justified, in particular with some of the data that comes in, you know, might also be wrong. So the, the demand on me goes up because I really need to be qualified to understand what's coming at me is that good or bad? And that I can only do if I'm a highly qualified expert. So for SMEs, that means you're going to pay more for certain expertise, but for other expertise, it's going to be much cheaper because it's replaced by artificial intelligence. In particular marketing, we see that being applied across the board now in large and small companies because the tools are coming out. Uh, now, a ton of tools in the marketing space are, are very accessible. 
And this then leads nicely into SMEs understanding their value proposition. You know, what customers want from you, you know, the human leader of this organization and what they're willing to pay for from you and what they're uh, prepared not to have a human do that can be automated. And this is where we can lean on, on the likes of ChatGBT. So it requires this innate understanding of uh, and the discernment of a value. So kind of leading into that, I've crowbarred uh, <laughs> this section in to, uh, to bring in your wonderful book, Value yeah. Proposition Design. Let's go back because again, I don't want to assume that our that our listeners understand this concept of value proposition. So let's kind of bring it right down to layman's levels. What is value proposition? And you know, if I've spent time innovating on my product or service, surely I just go out and sell it. What, what is this kind of Harvard concept or strategic concept that I need to understand as an SME leader called value proposition? Why is it important as I scale my business? Yeah, because we often, you know, let me put it in a simple way. We, we know our products and services and we know the performance of our products and services and we think you know better faster more beautiful that's fine and the better we can describe how our product does the more value we're creating <laughs> making fun of this a little bit because products don't matter per se they matter to certain customer segments in certain contexts so if your product is faster and it sounds almost trivial, but you will see in the process it isn't always reflected. If your product is faster, well, that only matters if customers really care, right? So a value proposition is not a product or service. It's how your products or services create value for your customer. Again, oh, that sounds kind of trivial. Well, let me be even more explicit. It's how your products and services alleviate or kill your customer's pains or how they help better achieve your customer's objectives. So what does that require? Number one, you have a very deep and hopefully quantitative understanding of the pains of your customers, the, the things that are holding them back and the gains of your customer, the things that they're really looking to achieve. So if you can quantify pains and gains, you will really be able to qualify if your products or services actually address those pains or help the customer achieve those gains. Now, again, that sounds all trivial, but we don't map these things and make them explicit and discuss them as a team. So I want to see evidence that you actually know in your company, what are the most important gains of your customer? Show me with evidence. Yeah, I just know. No, no, no. I don't want you to tell me. You just know. I want you to show me that nine out of 10 customers actually have this pain. Maybe seven out of 10 customers are paying to relieve that pain. Those are evidence-based things that I want to see. Then I believe you. Then I want you to show me that your product or service actually alleviates those pains. So I want you to show me the customers that agree with the fact that your product or service helps them alleviate that pain. So all of these things need to be evidence-based. It's all about creating value for customers. That's clear. We say we're customer-centric, but at the end of the day, if you look at, really dig deep, ask companies questions, you'll see they hardly have a good understanding of customers' jobs, pains, and gains. They can't produce the evidence that they actually know. And they can't produce the evidence that they are really creating value. Then they show you the numbers and sales and so on. And I say, that's great. That's good. But do you know why you're producing those sales numbers? Because sales numbers are just an outcome of how you're creating value for your customers. So we just need a very systematic and simple approach to constantly understand customer jobs, pains, and gains, and const constantly understand, are we still creating value for customers? That's around the value proposition. That's about creating value. And then you ask, well, how could you best capture value? And then we're in the business model conversation. So at the end of the day, business is simple. Are we creating value for customers? And are we capturing value for our business? Two things you need to constantly kind of explore and iterate on, the value proposition and the business model. 
And we need to do that systematically. And that is not, you know, Harvard or Wharton or Stanford based stuff. That's just how business works, creating value for customers and creating value for your business. Now, the thing that changed is that there's more competition than never. So we have to get more systematic about constantly understanding changing customer needs and constantly understanding if we're still creating value and constantly understanding if the business model is changing. That's just a requirement, even for the most fundamental businesses. And I see, you know, doctors, hairdressers, like all kinds of different professions looking at their value propositions and business models in a more systematic way. There is no excuse. This is just basic business. It's back to the fundamentals, but in a more systematic way because competition is forcing us to be a little bit more competitive and systematic about how we create value. So um, this resonates so, so strongly. I came from an, an industry where we designed and manufactured equipment for uh, large heavy engineering equipment for, for processing sand and aggregate for the construction industry. Typically, and what I've seen over the years is having worked with both software engineers in a, in, in, in a previous industry and then mechanical and electrical engineers in, in the most recent industry. And they tend to become very attached to the, the gizmo that they've just developed, the, the new feature that they've just developed. We put that onto a brochure, give it to the salesperson. The salesperson arrives to the, to the potential customer and then kind of fire hoses everything that they know about this feature. What changed certainly our business is taking time with the customer to walk around their existing operations, to really come to this with a beginner's mind, to ask lots of questions. We didn't have the language around the kind of pains and gains, but essentially we were pointing out going, you know, that looks like it's a struggle over there. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And then they go, oh yeah, well, you know, we process material in this and then we have to wait one day for it to dry. And, uh, it, you know, we have to then move it to another place where there's a further process and there's double handling and we can't do this until that's done. And, and you start to build up a picture where the real pain exists within this organization. That required a much more patient approach to really wanting to understand where those pains existed within our customers and and then to begin to quantify those pains which we did and then put those into again a return on investment model which actually then moved the conversation away from price to one yeah. to uh, it, it, we essentially had this this process where we were working with the customer to understand how we could better help their business how we could better alleviate their pains and and bring more gains and often those were social gains in terms of um you know mitigating waste runoff water for example, it was maybe polluting a nearby river and all of a sudden we could uh, protect that whilst making the operations more efficient. Yep. We were increasing their standing in the community, making them look better in the industry, but also saving them a lot of money in terms of mitigating double handling, yep. for example. I just wanted to share that with you in the context of value proposition, because ultimately this requires a number of things to change our thinking about how we sell in the first instance um to come to it with a beginner's mind and to really stand in the shoes of the customer can you speak to that alex in your experience yeah. and and what are some of the pitfalls that we as as um innovators of products and services yeah. fall into yeah so first of all this all sounds pretty trivial right so like good business people have always worked like this in an intuitive way. The difference now is we're making this approach a lot more systematic so it's predictable. So you don't depend on, oh, we have a really great leader who is doing this intuitively. And, you know, the proof kind of is, I remember 
when I started working with Steve Blank, Silicon Valley serial entrepreneur who invented the whole lean startup method with customer development, and then Eric Ries was one of his students and so on, I asked him, you know, he, he loved the business model canvas. He was teaching it at Stanford after he retired as an entrepreneur. I was asking, well, Steve, why are you so excited about this stuff? Because you built, you know, <laughs> great businesses without these tools. And his answer was, well, Alex, I'd have a lot less scars and I would have retired a lot earlier if I had had this systematic approach. So that's why he came up with the customer development process and brought in the business model canvas from us. So all we're doing today is making this process of innovation and entrepreneurship more systematic. We're turning it into a profession rather than something that was intuition. Now, entrepreneurship and innovation, there will always be an artistic aspect, but there's also a process and scientific aspect. It's not rocket science, but with the right tools and the right processes, this becomes more predictable and any business can implement it. You do not have to be a creative genius. So that's what this is all about. Taking these intuitive concepts that great business people would already apply and turning them into something that is repeatable and scalable for any business. It's almost like democratizing world-class innovation and entrepreneurship. You know, Roger Federer didn't wake up and become a world-class tennis player. He trained really hard building on all the training, you know, methods and the best coaches, you know, that you could ever find. Well, guess what? In business, it's the same thing. We've learned a lot. There are new <laughs> tools and new processes. They're now readily, readily accessible. And you're irresponsible as a business leader if you don't apply these tools and processes that make innovation and entrepreneurship accessible to any type of business. Again, it's not rocket science, but it still is a profession. Right? That's number one. Number two, as you said, it feels like more time, more patient, which is true. But if we look at the real costs of just taking an idea, just taking a feature, implementing it, throwing it in front of customers, then building it, we actually waste a lot of money and time and then realize, oh, nobody wants it. We're back to square one. So while it seems slower and it seems like we need more patience, which is kind of true, at the end, we actually save a lot of money and time when we do it with the right and systematic approach. And the big thing to learn, here's where we get to the biggest errors, innovation and entrepreneurship coming up with new stuff is a different profession than running a business. So every business leader in large and small companies need to realize one is running a business. We call that exploit. And the other area is inventing new products or improving products and business models. That is what we call explore. And as a business leader, you need to ask different questions if you're managing and different questions if you're inventing. If on time and on budget. That's a legitimate question, <laughs> return on investment. In innovation, you don't ask on time, on budget, because it doesn't matter. What you ask is, what did we learn? Did we learn that customers care or not? If they don't care, kill the project. And it needs to be okay for the teams to say, there's nothing there. This feature was a great idea, but nobody actually cares. So in innovation, you need to accept that a lot of the ideas won't work. That's why we talk about fail fast. So everybody is very fashionable now to talk about, yeah, fail fast. But when you look at processes, very few companies actually allow their team members to fail fast. So you need to build, besides a world-class culture of execution, managing your si supply chain, you need to create a world-class culture of allowing for experimentation. Now that sounds all oh, academic and for large companies. Well, go back to the example, the Swiss example that I mentioned with Laura Star. They had a steam, you know, a handheld steamer to iron clothes and to disinfect, you know, um, your home, your toys, etc. And they just needed to figure out a business model. So they experimented. Two out of the three projects they tried didn't work. And that's okay because one out of the three worked but they knew they needed to explore three to get one that would work. 
So the logic is different. So that's a, a lot of information, but the biggest failure that we see today that I would get around is don't build something <laughs> to experiment. So people immediately go and build prototypes and stuff. Number one, back to the basics, show me evidence that you understand your customer's jobs, pains and gains, like you beautifully explained with your example, and then only do you start working on solutions. People are very into solutions, building stuff. That is not where you start. That's number one. The second big mistake, I believe, is not understanding that the biggest financial gain will come from finding the right business model. It is an unexplored territory for small companies. They're so focused on products and services and creating value for customers. Of course, you need to do that. But the real financial gain is in finding the best business model that works for your customer, but also works for you. Simple thing, transactional revenues versus recurring revenues. That can be a 10x difference. So when you have transactional revenues, you have to sell again and again and again. It's unpredictable. You're able to shift that into recurring revenues with a subscription or by locking in customers. All of a sudden, you earn 10 times more, you sell once, and you earn for years, right? So those business models are not new. Newspaper subscriptions have existed. Yeah, kind of that business model expired in that industry. But there are new industries where you can now have a subscriptions. You have subscriptions to cars. You can have subscriptions to fashion. There are other ways, right? So I would really invite SME leaders to think business model. This is not big company territory. This is for everybody. And the difference can be, you know, multiplying your revenues by 10. Is there a, a practical checklist we can sign poster listeners to, Alex, in terms of kind of the, the all of the, the, the different business models that exist out there? So kind of the, here's the menu now, you know, can yeah. come can we test one of these to our very traditional business? Have you got something like that? Yeah, because we saw with Eve and, and with Strategize in my company, we saw people struggling with business small thinking. We created this last book behind me, the, the Invincible Company, which has a library of business small patterns in there. So tons of business models that can inspire you where you can ask, could I apply that? Some come from large companies, some come from small companies. The most interesting aspect I just throw in here is that you can copy business models from completely different industries into your industry. Business models is the biggest opportunity that has ever existed for small and medium-sized companies because it's accessible. Technology innovation, not always accessible because it requires sometimes crazy capabilities or expensive resources. Business model innovation is accessible to everybody. It's just a mindset. What's the best business model for me in a specific context I'm in? And with the business model patterns library, we offer this to anybody who wants to think more powerful business models. You can even assess your business model today and give it a score. So we score the design of a business model. How good is it? How competitive is it? And then, you know, if you have a low score, that's great because that means you have tons of opportunities to improve it. Brilliant. Uh, and as you're speaking, I'm thinking of my most recent purchase, which was a toothbrush from a company called Sur uh, Suri. I hope I've, I've said that correctly. And in terms of the business model, they, as part of subscribing or buying the toothbrush, I could subscribe to replaceable heads, one to come, it's an electric toothbrush, but one replaceable head to come every three months. And this is because they had pointed out about the fact that uh, in terms of good, maintaining good dental hygiene, you should replace the head of your brush every three months. But I hadn't thought of that, but they made it very easy for me when I was buying it to just click on this kind of three month subscription uh, model and uh, which I did, uh, it was very easy to, to get in. And that's me uh, subscribe perpetually, I believe, so until, I, until I choose to cancel it. And that's a toothbrush. So, and that's, a, that's taking away a pain from you and actually improving their business model because now they acquire you once and the revenue is recurring. So we, we underestimate that shift 
from transactional revenue to recurring revenue can for a company mean 10x the revenue, but it also means predictability. Because now you have to actively unsubscribe, which if, you're, if the company is not creating value will happen. But if they do create value, you know, they, 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 they will continue to reap that recurring revenue. That's what Dollar Shave Club did in the, in the shaving yeah. space. And what's interesting there is we don't realize, we just say, oh, yeah, they just did direct to consumer. Well, it's a bit more than that because, A, they had to replace the visibility. You know, no more stores means how are you going to get people to know you? Just because you're online, nobody's going to come to your store. The world is big. <laughs> There's a lot of competition. So they came up with viral videos. But the other thing is, because they were directly selling to consumers, they could now understand what was working and what was not working. So they could increase the service level and customer satisfaction in a way that Gillette never could because Gillette has an intermediary, which is retail. So they don't know the customer anymore. So they reintroduced the direct link or the example that you gave. They now understand when tons of customer unsubscribe, they immediately know there's a challenge and they can directly start to talk to customers who are unsubscribing to understand. So there are tons of things that today we can do as a small business that was not possible before because we had to go through big retail, et cetera. And that's still an option, right? That could be your business model. I'm not saying that's wrong. I believe, you know, there is no right business model. There's no magic thing. You just need to figure out what is the, the right business model for you in your journey of business. It could be direct to consumer, could be retail. Sometimes people hear, oh, I need to do direct to consumer. No, there is no dogma. You need to find the right business model for you in your context and your business journey. Yeah, I love that. There is no dogma. Uh, just coming back to something you've touched upon and you know you've mentioned and 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 amplified throughout is the importance of of seeing the value from the customer's perspective and that really requires you to spend time with your customer for those who and i've seen this firsthand in a scaling business when you're a small sme um you're interfacing with customers all of the time as you scale you tend to spend more time in the boardroom and less time with the customer so what is the cha uh, how do we how do we solve this challenge of actually really understanding what we do from a customer perspective and making sure that that's fresh all of the time. Because the other challenge here, of course, is once we've created systems and processes and structures and an infrastructure and logistics to support our old business model, it is very challenging to, to change. So yeah. can you speak to that, Alex? So you know what? I'm going to try something here and visualize. <laughs> so, oh, brilliant. I love this. There you uh, go. For those so, listening, uh, I encourage you to jump onto YouTube. Alex is, uh, is, is stepping us through a wonderful presentation here. I'll, I'll walk you through it, you know, by talking also. So the, the listeners, you know, don't need the visuals. So when you start with an idea, you're basically searching for the right value proposition that customers care about in a business model that can scale. So you're searching, you're going to do a lot of, you know, conversations with customers, you're going to get a lot of things wrong, but ultimately at one point you're going to figure out, hopefully that, you know, what you should do, or you kill the idea. Once you've found that, right, you're saying, then you go into scaling. So now we are implementing a business model. We're building this stuff, we're scaling it, we're gonna focus on managing the supply chain. So these two worlds of search, scale and manage are very different. Searching is messy. You'll make a lot of mistakes, failure is part of the game. You need to be extremely agile and pivot a lot, be willing to kill ideas that don't work. But once you've figured it out, then, you try to iron out every single mistake. Failure is not an option anymore because now you're building a supply chain. Your website has to be up 99% of the time. So you manage. So these are two different worlds. And what happens inevitably to every company, because every large company was once a startup, right? But what happens is 99% of our effort goes into exploiting the existing 
We perfect the processes. You Everything that looks different, oh, you know, this customer has a different behavior. Well, that's not our key customer segment we're targeting. So you optimize until you got it perfectly right. You cut out the fat, right? <laughs> so it becomes lean in a way that, you know, you're operating, bam, 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 bam. Everything is predictable. That's exploit. But it also means that you kill the habit of exploration. So once you scale a company, you manage a business, you need to be aware that at one point you're going to have to reinvigorate, you have to recreate that exploration capability. So you need to be able, best companies today are world-class at managing the existing exploit and world-class at exploring the future. Now, small companies will say, but I don't have the bandwidth to do both. Yeah. Well, okay, if you want to disappear, then don't explore. But inevitably, business malls and value propositions expire like a yogurt in the fridge. So you just don't have a choice. So if you don't, think back to the Swiss example I like, you know, Laura Starr, if you don't create an exploratory capability, so at least some people in your company that also explore while you're managing the existing, guess what? You're never going to explore because innovation is not a stunt. It's not a one-time thing. It's all the time in parallel to your world-class execution. So that means when you're a small company, some people are going to have to have a part-time job exploring. And as soon as you're 100 people, you need at least one, I'd say five people who are you know, tasked with exploration all the time because inventing the future is just part of your business today. It's not enough to focus on managing a business model because if we make that better and better, we'll just more efficiently die. So a lot of leaders understand that. In particular, in SMEs, they say business model innovation is now a matter of survival because I can't just compete on technology and products because everybody's copying me overnight or doing even better, has lower cost structure, you know, outside of Switzerland or so. So the only thing that I then have is not just to think new value propositions, new technologies, but embed that in better business models. Great example of that is, uh, is Hilti, <laughs> a company we know for machine tools for builders. They realized Better tools was go wasn't going to cut it. So when the financial crisis hit, they had to reinvent the business model. So they came up with a service to small and medium-sized construction companies of offering them a subscription to tools for builders. And they would take over the right tool at the right construction site at the right time. So they became a logistics company. <laughs> so they shifted away from just manufacturing and selling towards managing a fleet of tools for builders for the construction companies. Now, here's what happened. All of a sudden, the builders, the construction companies say, this is an amazing service. You're taking away all my headaches. You're making everything predictable. Hey, could you also manage the tools of your competitors with your fleet service? So all of a sudden, Hilti becomes the answer to the biggest headache of their um, of their um, customers, and they now become a headache to their competitors because Hilti is managing the whole tool fleet. So that's a business model shift that is spectacular. And this is what we all now need to think. Could we come up with better business models? Just improving what we're doing is great. We have to do that, but it's not enough because otherwise you're going to efficiently die with, you're going to die with a very efficient business because your business model expired, right? So we need to be able to think all at the same time, efficiency innovation, improving the processes, sustaining innovation, new products, new uh, value propositions, maybe new digital channels and transformative innovation. Could we come up with better business models while we're running a specific business model today? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I love that uh, that presentation and the explanation, Alex. Again, making this super practical for our listeners. Spending time with your customer in whatever guise is clearly uh, fundamental here to to actually testing, exploring, validating uh, business models. 
the how do we how, how do we uh, interact with our customers? How do we get that yeah. feedback? You know, yeah. uh, what, is, what does that look like yeah. practically? So, you know, if yeah. people have taken the last hour to listen to this, what are yeah. we going to encourage them to do? If they're hearing this value proposition to, uh, concept for the first time or business model for the first time, what do we want them to practically do when they yeah. finish listening to this? Yeah. I'll, I'll start with what not to do, right? right. Because... <laughs> Because we're very solution focused, we brainstorm, we come up with a solution, and then we show the solution to customers and ask them, do you want this? So we just frame the whole conversation around us. And we actually ask them to judge a solution and, you know, do they really know? Or even worse, we ask them, what do you want? Like, what could we do to make your life easier? So we're asking, people who have no clue about solutions to come up with solutions. And there's this beautiful example of the late Craig Christensen, where he says, you know, people hire milkshakes to do things. They talk to a milkshake, you know, fast food company, and the, the fast food company asked customers, how would you like us to improve the milkshake? They did everything customers, you know, told them. So they talked to customers and said, oh, they did the right thing. They improved every aspect of the milkshake based on customer feedback and zero impact on sales or whatsoever. Think of it, right? What did they do wrong? What they did wrong is to ask the customers about solutions. Customers are not the solution experts. Customers are experts of what they're trying to get done. So Clay, you know, there's a video online where he talks about this milkshake thing. They said, okay, they changed their approach. Now they didn't ask what customers wanted, they observed customers. They just watched them and they realized, huh, customers come in early in the morning, they buy a milkshake and off they go. So then they talked to customers and said, what are you trying to get done when you kind of come in and buy that milkshake? And they say, well, I'm just on the way to work and I want some food and you grab it on the way, put it in the cup holder and then, and just, you know, kind of stay full until, until noon. So they realized, huh, okay, that's the context what if we improve the solution, the milkshake, for that specific context? Make it slower to kind of sip during the drive so it's not finished right away, make it a little bit more interesting. And so they optimized the solution. They came up with a solution for that customer context and problem, jobs, pains, and gains. So the simple thing I'd ask people to do is not to focus on solutions. Never, well, never is maybe the wrong word, no dogma here. But avoid asking customers what they want. Really try to understand their jobs, what they're trying to get done, the tasks, the pains, what's holding them back from doing that well, the risks that they fear, and the gains. What is the customer actually trying to achieve quantitatively? Oh, you're a salesperson, you want to increase sales? Well, what's good? 5%, 10%? Understand their objectives. So once you deeply understood their jobs, pains, and gains, because your customers are experts of what they're trying to get done, they're experts of what is not working, and they're experts of what they're trying to achieve, what does success look like? Understand that. And then creating a solution becomes obvious. Now, it's not always obvious. You have to come up kind of with the right things and given the right cost structures and so, but don't ask customers what they want figure out what they're trying to get done, and then design solutions that you can test with them to understand, will that work? So it's an iterative process that is based on, sounds so trivial, never happens in reality, trying to figure out what customers are trying to get done. If you understand that, which sounds so easy, <laughs> but there are techniques to do that, then actually, coming up with the right value propositions and then embedding them in the right business model is, you know, the artistic part that you, that's your job. Solutions is your job. Don't ask the customers for solutions. Now, I'll kind of just finish with, yeah, there's a gray line. There are situations where you can co-create customers, where you rapidly iterate and create solutions with them, but in the context of having understood their jobs, pains, and gains. But don't ask. Remember the milkshake example? They improved the milkshake based on everything the customer said and that had zero impact on sales. Keep that lesson in mind. 
Customers are not the experts of the solution. That's you. Yeah, I'm smiling here because you have just beautifully articulated for me the nuance in the, the late Henry Ford statement that never ask, a, if I asked the customer what he wanted, uh, he would say a faster horse. I've given him what he needs, which is actually to get from A to B faster uh, and safer. Uh, so you've described beautifully, essentially, don't ask them what they want in the context of something you've already developed, um, but actually be forensic in discerning what it is they actually need. And that process of being forensic is one where you literally observe you ask lots of questions, you spend time before you whip out the latest gizmo that you've developed to say, da-da. So um, that requires a real shift in mindset, I suspect, Alex, in terms of actually creating context for yourself between I'm coming here as an explorer, not yes. coming here as an exploiter. Yes. And, and the thing I'd add, I, I just back from a week in London where I worked with a bunch of product managers, is when you are early in the process and you're trying to figure out some, something substantially new, don't try to make it too scientific and statistically you know, significant. And at the beginning, you go super fast and you just try to figure out, is there something there? So the other thing is people say everything needs to start with a customer. That's not true. You might have a great technology, a patent. You're going to try to find a problem that you can solve. That's okay. You go to the first customer segment. You try to figure out, do they have jobs, pains, and gains that I could solve with my technology? And maybe after talking to 10 customers, you realize, oh, nothing there. They don't have a budget for that. You pivot. So you don't have to be too scientific too early. <laughs> then in the next phase, Okay, now I figured out a segment that actually has those challenges. I'm going to try to figure out a solution. Now you get a bit more precise. You're going to go a little bit deeper. So when we're in, in real exploration, we go really fast. We don't need to be too detail-oriented. Detail comes over time. So the way I like to put it is, you know, at the beginning, you have a light that's very weak. It just shines out, but it's a little bit of light. Okay, now we're going to shine a little bit more light and more and more light over time, right? So because sometimes people ask, oh, when do I know? It was like if, as if there was an on-off switch. No, you know a little bit more with every experiment you do, with every new conversation. And when you start to scale, you should know a lot. But at the very beginning, when you're exploring a completely new idea in a completely new kind of field that you don't know the customer so, you don't have to be too forensic because otherwise you're going to get caught up with doing a lot of experimentation when there's nothing there. So you need the agility to make decisions fast. Okay, nothing there, I'm gonna to pivot to this segment. Oh, something there, I'm gonna go deeper. Oh, they don't have a budget to pay. I'm gonna to pivot to the next segment. So you need to be extremely fast in this process, which entrepreneurs are good at and corporations are not so good at because they're very meticulous right away. If you're in, in slight product improvement, you can be meticulous. If you're going into full uncertainty, I've never worked with that customer segment. I don't know the supply chain. Don't be too meticulous, go fast and create more evidence the more you know. So you decrease the risk and you increase the investments. You go fast, small investments, the more you know, the more you can invest. It's what we call metered funding in the startup world. We give little amounts of money at the beginning. Because the other aspect is sometimes leaders get caught up with, I want a big return. I'm going to make a big investment. That works in execution. In innovation, what happens when you give a team a lot of money? They They're going it. to build the thing they have in mind, right? <laughs> people love building stuff, in particular when you have engineers. So don't give people too much money early on. Because when you give people too much money, and that's the difference with the myth, you actually increase the probability that they're going to fail because they're gonna build something that nobody wants. So the other myth, when, when, when leaders of SMEs tell me, yeah, but innovation is expensive, I say, don't confuse R&D and innovation. Innovation at the beginning is insanely cheap because all you need to do is talk to customers. That's the first step of innovation. It gets expensive when you scale and you potentially invest in a technology or building a supply chain. 
But when you do that, you should already have enough evidence that it's going to work. So innovation, when done right, is actually extremely cheap because R&D and technology doesn't equal innovation. Innovation is simply creating value for customers with a business model that creates value for your company. And you can explore that in very cheap ways today. Yeah, I love that. There's something psychological that we have as a default that the greater the constraint, the more creative and innovative we become. <laughs> so actually just providing more constraints of the outset by, uh, by putting uh, kind of less budget to this actually creates um, greater innovation, greater creativity within the team. I've always, I've always found that uh, there's a saying here, cliche saying here, must do is a great master. Uh, and I've seen that time and time again. So just to recap on that, because I'm, I, I'm loving this this morning, the, 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 it's critically important for the leaders to be forensic with the jobs that the customer needs to do where they have stumbled across or maybe spent time innovating, inventing, but they don't have a problem to solve. It's for them then to become a pain detective, to go and search for a struggle or a pain that this potential innovation could solve. And that's really about looking at what you have from a customer's perspective, back to being forensic again. So, in the context of of what we've discussed this morning, there's a there's a lot in here. Your five books are uh, profiled beautifully there, and I'm glad you referenced the Invincible Company. It's a book that I haven't come to yet, uh, and I'm excited actually to get into that in terms of exploring the various business models and patterns of success that we see out there. Is there anything you want to to share with the the listeners that we haven't touched upon, Alex, before we move into the close? Yeah. So a big one that unfortunately I still see with some of the, maybe let me call it more old school kind of business leaders. They want business plans, right? They tell me, give me a business plan, give me a business case. So when it comes to innovation, business plans and business cases are the death penalty of innovation because you're basically telling your team, prove me that this is going to work. So what are they going to do? They're going to, you know, sketch out a, a, a 20 slide PowerPoint presentation and make you believe this is a great idea that's going to work. What you actually want is them to say, to admit, this is a great idea, has great potential. We do not know if it's going to work. We're going to experiment and bring evidence to the table to invest in this idea. And if we find no evidence, we're going to kill the idea, right? So don't ask for business plan. Ask for different things at different stages. So for the first three months, all you ask for is, Show me evidence that customers have this, let's call it problem. I like the job pains and gains as a more sophisticated way to frame it, but just show me evidence for the problem. Okay, that's all I want. Think about the business model. Maybe you can already gather some evidence of willingness to pay, right? Did, do they want to pay? Do they have a budget? So you can gather that in the first you know, 12 weeks. Second sprint, you ask them for evidence that they actually care about the solution you have in mind, because now you have proof of the customer job pains and gains. Now you start finding proof, evidence that you can solve that problem. You can address their job pains and gains. Okay, that's the second sprint. Third sprint, you now ask them to show you evidence of how to acquire and retain customers. What's the cost? <laughs> And, you know, to acquire them and to retain them, given you already started to experiment on, on pricing, right? And then the last one is, show me evidence that we can actually do this at scale. So you don't ask for all of it upfront. You ask for different, you ask for evidence for dis different aspects of the business case over time. And then I have leaders who tell me, yeah, but I need a spreadsheet. And I say, okay, that's fine. I actually want the team to show you a spreadsheet on day one, but you need to understand that the spreadsheet with the numbers is a fantasy made explicit. That spreadsheet becomes real when they bring evidence to the table that that spreadsheet could actually work. Oh, I got, you know, eight out of 10 customers. They already have a budget for that. We could take it out of that budget. 
Okay, next piece of evidence. I got, you know, 20 out of 40 customers who are willing to pay a specific price. Now that spreadsheet is becoming evidence-based, supported by evidence. So for leaders, they should stop asking for business plans and start asking for evidence. So that allows you then to make evidence-based decisions, not business uh, opinion-based decisions. Because you know what? When the leader likes it, nobody's going to tell the leader your, your baby is ugly. So you actually want to work on evidence, not on the you know, leader's opinion. That is a big shift, right? Because in exploit, experience matters. You know, the leaders have built this business. They run the business. So they actually know what's right and what's wrong. In innovation, often <laughs> your experience with the past, you know, inhibits thinking about how the future should look like. That should be evidence-based. So we need to move away from business plan and business case decisions towards evidence-based decisions where we judge the evidence that supports the business case. That's a fundamental shift. So stop the business plans because it's the death penalty of innovation. Here, here. Speaking of innovation, I'm curious before we move into our close, how you guys have scaled your own business, given that you know, your name is synonymous with the business model canvas. You're a high profile figurehead of, of strategizer. On the one hand, you can see that as a huge strength. On the other hand, then potential impediment to actually scaling beyond yourself. How have you managed to, to scale strategizer? What have been some of the fundamental inflection points there? Yeah, I think the, the first one was actually creating the brand strategizer. So we were known for the business model canvas and for business model innovation. So at one point we said, and it was just before we launched the, the second book, Value Proposition Design, we need to be known for business, not just for the business model canvas. So we created the strategizer brand and created the logo. We simplified it just recently. And then we put that logo on every book, the old books and the new books. And that started to create this strategizer brand. So today in companies, nobody asks, you know, I want Alex Osterwald or most people don't even know who I am. And that's fine. That's exactly what we wanted. So we created a brand that they ask for. They love the tools. They love the methodology. The other thing is we gave away tools forever. So, you know, you can use all the stuff out there, business model canvas, value proposition canvas, they're all branded. Now, some people don't respect, you know, intellectual property. They just cut out the strategizer part, and put their own on it. Got to live with that. But because millions of people, literally millions use our tools, the brand has spread around the world. So that's number one. Number two is then I didn't want to build a training um, or consulting business. So I was at this idea of a software platform. So we played with that. We had an iPad app to test our ideas. But what we did then realize is it was early. It was too early. So we built a productized service business. We helped big companies today to build growth engines based on a productized service that runs on our platform. We're only now in the process of monetizing platform. So while we knew we wanted to end up with platform, that's the phase we're in now, we also learned that we needed to go through a business model that would get us there, which was selling productized enterprise services to large co companies. So while I didn't want to build a consulting company, I figured out a way to do that on the path towards becoming a platform company. And the inspiration there was Netflix, you know, when... Um, um, Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph founded the company. They knew they wanted to do streaming, but it was too early in the internet. So they started with DVD by mail. They had to do one business model to get to another business model. So that's what we're trying to do. So sometimes you have this crazy goal in mind, but you got to be pragmatic. You can't be delusional and just say to get there in 10 years, we need to go through these short term iterations of a business model. So that's how we scaled from writing books towards building an enterprise service company with productized services that run our, on our platform. And we're now monetizing the platform. This is the process we're in. So we gradually, you know, have grown through certain business models. That's the way we look at it. Always at the crazy goal, 
But the steps to get that crazy goal were a little bit longer than I would have hoped, but we're still on the process to get there. So the vision, often you shouldn't compromise. The steps to make that vision reality, the intermediary business models, that's what you need to sometimes compromise on. Well done. I'm, cl I'm glad I posed that question because there's so much in that, even that final remark about, you know, you shouldn't compromise on your vision, but be prepared to iterate and take some detours along the way. Uh, there's, it's so profound. We've done a lot of episodes on the importance of vision and self. Uh, and you're still an incredibly young guy, Alex. Uh, you're looking fresh and well uh, for, for everything that you've created and continue to create. Given the experience that you've had, can you share with our listeners three timeless takeaways? So for me, number one was the value of having a breakthrough coach. So I was a terrible leader, I think. And I just thought that's me. You know, that's who I am. I'm not a manager. But the reality is that was a really easy excuse to not do the hard work, to become a leader. So it's a choice. So we should not think, you know, we are who we are and we can't change. We just make decisions and then need to live with those. So I fundamentally changed or was able to change because I worked with a breakthrough coach. And I do believe I'm a slightly better leader than I was maybe, you know, four years ago. I make, uh, you know, decisions a lot faster. I'm now building a leadership team, whereas before, you know, it just didn't, it didn't work the right way. So I can just advise any business person, in particular business leaders, bring on a breakthrough coach. And I'm not talking about a technical coach that can help you, you know, do better talks or so. Work on yourself, you know, work on who you are and try to become a better version of yourself every day. Doing it alone is tough. I have very little willpower. So with a coach, I was able to get closer to who I would like to be. So that's a, something you need to do every day. And it's much easier when you have a breakthrough coach to, to do that. In my case, it was a lady called Shani Ospina uh, based in Vienna, and we're doing it remotely, right? That was a huge breakthrough for me um, that changed me as a person in my life and changed me as a business leader, because at the end of the day, I'm the same person at home or in business, right? So you're one person and you should work on becoming a better, better person and you'll automatically be a better leader. And we make that accessible to every one of our team members, actually. Everybody has a budget for coaching. Every single employee can get coaching within a certain budget. So that's number one. <laughs> that's a big one. And number two um, for me was, you know, defining success. So I always, you know, looked at these companies that scale fast. And, you know, I, th I thought I need to be like that. And if I can't achieve that, I'm a huge fraud and failure. I realized that A, there's no value in that. And B, look at how many of those ended up, you know, FTX. And so it's scaling at any price. <laughs> and why? Like, why? So I now really define success for myself. I don't care what others do. I try to live up to the variables that define success for me. Part of it is business success. Yeah, some of that is for the ego. Sure, I'm a human being. But some of it is related, you know, to the relationship I have with my children, which is now a lot better because I did work on myself and I compromise on business achievements because success is a set of variables. It's not what we read in the press, you know, the, the fame and money. And so, yeah, guess what? A lot of those people are not so happy. Again, sounds like a trivial thing. But if you don't define success for yourself, you will actually submit to the success criteria that random people or the press defines for you. That's not a good way to live. So that's the, the second one. And the third one I'd say is we as business leaders can have a profound impact on the world, not by earning money and then giving it away to charity. I actually think that's pretty inefficient. I think the most efficient thing to do is to create better work, a better workplace. Because if your team members are happy, you know, at their work, guess what? They're going to be happier human beings. They're going to be happier at home, but they're also going to create better, you know, human relationships within the business. So I believe, you know, that the biggest impact we can have as entrepreneurs, as business leaders, is the people we work with, the work environments we create. That 
is not um, a nice to have. I believe it's an ethical responsibility. And guess what? You do that, you're actually going to create more business impact. This is not a fluffy thing. At the end of the day, that translates into real financial impact. That's my take on it. Do we measure it well enough yet? No, but I really believe in it. And, and one of my goals with strategizers is that we get to you know, systems where we can measure the financial impact on a business of a better workplace. So that's what inspires me and keeps me going. It's not, oh, I want to create a big, great business that makes a lot of money. I'm trying to do that, sure. That's an outcome of doing great work. At the end of the day, I'm most proud of, you know, trying to create a better world. <laughs> Can I do it? We'll see. At least I'm trying. Those are so profound, Alex. We're absolutely aligned. The, your final message there just brings this together beautifully because it's... Everything we do is to inspire, connect, and enable millions of SME to scale with purpose. I fundamentally believe that when leaders become more aware, as you have become as a leader, by virtue of engaging with a coach, and you've become a better person, a better leader, a better father, that has an impact not only on your partner, on your kids, but on your team, on their families, on community, society, and economies at large. So I love what you're doing. I wish you every success with, with everything that you're doing. I hope many more millions engage with your work. Given everything you've mentioned, what, what is next for you? So right now, people always ask me, what's the next book? Well, right now, no next book It's really you know, getting strategizer to the next level, um, getting us to that platform company that we aspire to be, because if we get there, we can have more impact. We can actually make change happen at a larger scale. So our goal is, you know, to really change the way the largest companies around the planet work. We start with innovation. Ultimately, it's just about creating better management systems. So that's what we're trying to do step by step. So everything that's next is, um, you know, with that purpose in mind, you know, creating better workplaces. So next step for us is the platform so that companies can scale their impact. So we're at their service. We're kind of their guides, so their Sherpas. If we can get them to succeed, guess what? We'll have more impact. So everything in, in that service is what we're trying to do. And the next step is platform. Good on you. If people want to connect with you, Alex, find out more about your work if they already are not familiar with your work, how best to reach you? So we publish a lot on strategizer.com. We give a lot away. There's a blog there, so you can find a ton of information. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about myself, you can go to Instagram. You know, I love sharing stories of Switzerland, of hikes, of the mountains. You'll see a little bit about the person behind uh, the, the tools. So depending on what you're interested in, just go to strategizer.com. You'll find a lot. Otherwise, Instagram, Alex Osterwalder. Alex, I want to thank you today for your incredible knowledge, your experience, your wisdom, your brilliant energy, and the innovative way and in the way you have actually delivered uh, a masterclass on business modeling and uh, value proposition. Um, I wish you all the very best with everything you're doing. Take care. Well, thanks for having me and keep up the great work. I love your mission and I do think it's incredibly important. So we need more of that. Thanks, thanks. for doing this. Thank you so much.